thank you for visiting my channel, Medical Assistant with Miss K. So I've tried this a couple times. I was having some technical difficulties. So we're going to try this again. They say three times a charm. So we're going to see. Um, but thank you for visiting my channel. If you are new to my channel, just a little bit about me. My name is Miss K, short for Kendra. I have been a medical assistant for, um, how long have I been in this field? I've been in this field for... 2022 will actually make 17 years that I've been in this field. And I've been teaching as a medical assistant and a medical office assistant instructor six years altogether. Um, but I've been teaching um, consecutive, consecutively for the last four years. So I am going to go through some CMAA exam questions. First of all, thank you to you all who voted. I did put up a poll in the community section. I can now do community posts. Um, so I put up a poll just asking... Um, um, for a vote on what my next video should be. And this had the highest number of votes. So I decided to go ahead and create some slides using some of the questions that, the same questions that I use for my students, for my actual students who are taking the CMAA exam is the same questions that I am going to go over with you all today. Um, now, I'm going to do a separate video just talking about the different certifications because, you know, we have the CMAA, CCMA, um, CMA, um, RMA. I did have a couple questions from people asking the differences between those. So I will definitely do a, another video. And also I'll do another video just talking about the differences between a um, clinical medical assistant and a administrative medical assistant. So this exam certification practice that we're going to be doing today. This is for the clinical, um, I'm sorry, not clinical. This is for the uh, certified medical administrative assistant, okay? Um, and these questions that we're going to go through, these, these are questions that you may see on the actual certification exam. Now, you will not see the exact question. Some of you may because every test is different. So some people, they do see the exact question. However, um, even though you won't see the same exact question, the information is still the same. So once you know the information, it doesn't matter how the question is asked. So I don't, one thing I always tell my students is to not expect to see the exact same questions. When you go through these exam questions, these practice tests, and you're going into the exam expecting to see those exact same questions, you are going to set yourself up for failure. So do not expect to see these same questions. Rather, just pay attention and really make sure you are absorbing the information. Okay. So when you, when we're looking at these questions and you see, um, you'll get, of course, it's multiple choice. So you'll have four options. So only one option can be the answer. And so what you want to do is you want to make sure that you know what each of those other three options mean. And so you'll see what I mean in a second when we get started. Um, all right, let's go ahead and get started. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to ask a question and then I'm just going to give a few moments. I see um, I did get on live tonight. I didn't it wasn't planned. It was, you know, just. I wasn't, I didn't have anything to do. My class ended last week. I don't have a new semester starting until January. So I had some time tonight. I said, let me just go ahead and do these exam questions while I feel like it. So um, if someone happens to hop on live, great. Um, if not, and you're watching the replay, that's fine as well. Because as I'm asking the questions, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just kind of pause for a minute before I go to the next question to give you time to Think about it, choose an answer, and you can kind of test yourself. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Okay, question one. Which of the following should a CMAA take before closing the office? CMAA, the Certified Medical Administrative Assistant. So what should you do before closing the office? Which of the following? Activate the security system, file charts that were used that day, turn off the answer machine or follow up on refill requests. I'm just going to wait a moment, give you time to think about it, and then we'll see what the answer is. All right, so let's see. And the correct answer was activate the security system. So let's look at this for a second. First of all, one of the things I always tell my students is to when you're, when you're looking at these questions, you always want to eliminate options that you know that the answer is not. So first of all, the question is about closing the office. So we can look at C and D and automatically rule those out. So that's one of the things, I'm sorry, I went too quick. 
So that's one of the things that I always tell my students. Look first at what you can rule out. So if we're closing the office, we can automatically rule out C because we're not turning off the answering machine. If anything, we're turning on the answering surface when we're closing the office, right? Follow up on refill requests. That's another thing that we're not doing um, as we close the office, right? Because we're trying to get out of there. So it came down between A and B. So even though, yeah, we're going to file the charts that we use that day, what are we going to do be right before closing the office? What is something that you know that we absolutely have to do before closing the office? Let's activate the security system. OK, so if you chose that answer, you are correct. All right. It says a patient needs an EKG for rapid heart rate. Which of the following should be recorded as the reason? Tachypnea, bradypnea, tachycardia, or bradycardia? Rapid heart rate. This is one of those medical terminology questions. Now, for the CMAA exam, um, it's hard to say how much medical terminology you have on your test. First of all, like I said, every test is different. So, you know, you may have a test that has a lot of terminology on and the person next to you may may have a test where they only see just a few terminology questions and maybe they'll have a lot of HIPAA questions or a lot of scheduling questions. Every test is different. So I will say that. All right. So rapid heart rate. Let's see what that answer is. All right. So if you chose tachycardia, you are correct. So again, what of these options were we able to immediately eliminate? First of all, we should, because it says rapid heart rate, we should have been able to eliminate A and B because tachypnea and bradypnea, those refer to breathing, right? This um, suffix ipnea refers to breathing or air, okay? So we can automatically rule those out. And then that brought us to tachycardia and bradycardia. Tachy refers to fast or increased. Brady refers to slow. So if you chose tachycardia, you are correct. Okay. All right. So when preparing a claim, a CMAA should use the following format for the patient's birthday. Two day, two, two, two digit day, two digit month, two digit year, um, two digit month, two digit day, two digit year, two digit month, two digit day, and four digit year, or two digit day, two digit month, and then four digit year. So I'm going to give you a moment to look at this before I go on to the slide, to the next slide. Give you a moment to look at this. And I do see that there is another person watching live. If you're watching live and you're not shy, go ahead and comment and say hi. Let me know where you're watching from. I'm just curious to see who else is on here watching. Okay, so let's see. All right, so if you chose C, that is correct. This is the professional way of writing out a patient's birthday, right? So first of all, A and B. Those options should have automatically been eliminated because professionally, we always want to write the year out. So these two, we cannot automatically just eliminate. Oh, hi, Claudine. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for joining me. I know that this was not scheduled. I, I don't know if you heard in the beginning, but I my students, my class ended last week. I don't have another one until January. So I said, let me just go ahead and get on here tonight. So thank you for joining and feel free to um, comment an answer, you know, if you feel like you know the answer. If you want to just watch and not say anything, that's fine too. But thank you so much for watching. So yeah, so the first two options we were able to automatically eliminate because um, they are written, the year is written in two digits as opposed to four. And so when you're writing out date of birth, you always want to write the two digit month first, the two digit day, and then the four digit year. So I know in other cultures, they write the day first and then the month. But um, here uh, we use the month, day and then the year. OK, which of the following word roots mean swallow? Which of the following word roots mean swallow? So again, another medical term question. 
I'll give you a moment to think about it. And before I go to the next slide. Okay, so let's see what the answer is. All right, so if you chose C, you are correct. So phalange um, refers to the fingers and the toes. Um, pharynge refers to the throat. And then pod refers to the foot. So if you chose C for phage, you are correct. This is the word root that means swallow. All right. Which of the following is an abbreviation for a type of insurance? Which of the following is an abbreviation for a type of insurance? POS, COB, DME, or OIG? Which of the following is a type of insurance? Give you a moment to look at that. All right, so let's see. All righty, if you chose A, you are correct. POS, that's point of service. That is a type of insurance. So POS, the point of service is like a, um, it's a managed care organization. And it's kind of like a mixture of a HMO and a PPO in the sense that um, patients who have a POS, they have to, um, they have to choose a PCP like an HMO. However, they can go outside of the network like a PPO. Um, COB refers to coordination of benefits. We'll see the question about that eventually. DME um, is durable medical equipment. And then OIG is the um, Office of Inspector General. Okay. What's the next step when you've received a patient's results? What is the next step? So questions like this, Keywords, okay, look for keywords, next step, or, you know, if something says first step or initially, or what is priority, those are going to be keywords in your questions. Are you going to file the records? Are you going to photocopy the records for the provider to review and sign? Are you going to ensure that the provider has initiated the reports? Or are you going to note in the report that the patient was notified of the results? So you receive the patient's results. What is the next step? What do you want to do next? I'll give you a moment to think about that. What is the next step? All right. So let's see. All right, you're going to ensure the provider has initiated the report. So first of all, whenever you get patient results, before you do any filing or anything, um, you want to make sure that the patient, that the provider has initiated the reports, uh, either initial or sign the reports, however you all do it. So we're not going to photocopy the records for the provider to review. We're going to give him the actual results, right? We're not going to note in the report that the patient was notified. Why? Because the patient has yet to be notified. We just got the results. So again, process of elimination led us to see, we're gonna ensure that the provider has an issue that reports. Okay. A patient has a co-insurance split of 80-20. This is a good one. And his visit came to $360. How much does the patient owe? Coinsurance split of 80-20 and his visit came to $360. How much does the patient owe? Give that a couple moments. All right, so let's see. So the patient owes $72. Now, a co-insurance split, split of 80-20 means that the insurance is going to cover 80% of the patient's visit, and then the patient is responsible for the other 20% of that visit. And so how did we figure that the patient owes $72? Well, it says that the visit came to $360, right? 
What's 20% of $360? That's going to be $72. Now, for anybody who does not know how to find the percentage of a number, you simply, okay, take 20 for an example. To find out what 20% of a number is, you simply calculate 0.20 times um, the visit amount, right? So if it was 30, percent you would you would calculate 0. 0.30 times $360. Now when it's single digits it's a little bit tricky. So if it was single digits, let's say it was 5%, you wouldn't just say 0. 0.5 times 360 because then that would mean that you're saying 50, okay, 50% 50 or half of 360. You would add a zero in front of the number. So just be mindful of that. When you're doing percentages um, with single digits, you always want to put a zero before it. But when you're in the double digits, once you hit 10% you'll just put 0.10 times the number, okay? In this case, that number is $360. So I hope that is not confusing. If any of this is confusing, any question is confusing, feel free to comment below and then I can address that for you. All right, so what is the purpose of the encounter form? Is it to establish financial responsibility, to save time and improve accuracy in data entry? for workers' compensation, or to verify patient demographics. The purpose of the encounter form. I'll wait a moment. All right. Okay, so it's to save time and improve and improve accuracy and data entry. So the encounter form, also known as a super bill, um, it has the pre-printed um, CPT codes, diagnosis codes for the doctor, right? So the doctor will check off the codes that he used for the visit. Um, and all we have to do is transfer it to the claims form. So having an encounter form, it saves so much time and it also improves accuracy and data entry because we don't have to worry about entering the wrong codes on the claim form because we're getting it directly from the doctor. The doctor, well, I should say provider because um, you may not necessarily work for a doctor. Maybe you work for a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant, the PA. So um, that encounter form just saves so much um, time and it also improves, it improves accuracy because you're getting it directly from the provider. Um, it doesn't establish financial responsibility. That's not what it does. Um, it's not for workers' comp. That's something separate. And it does not verify patients' demographics. We use the um, a patient's ID to verify and also the patient information sheet. Okay, next question. Out-of-pocket expense that must be paid before an insurance company begins to pay out benefits. This is an out-of-pocket expense that must be paid before an insurance company begins to pay out benefits? Is it a deductible, co-payment, allowed amount, or co-insurance? Give you a moment to think about that. All right, let's see. Alrighty, if you said deductible, you are correct. The deductible is an out-of-pocket expense that a um, patient or an enrollee must pay before an insurance company begins to pay out benefits. So um, I like to always tell my students, think about a, your car insurance, right? I always use that for an example because most of us have cars and we have car insurance. Well, we, sh we should, we better have car insurance if we have a car. But anyway, I use that example because it's easier to, to kind of think about. So if you get in an accident, um, you know that your insurance company makes you pay a deductible before they will pay out the benefits, before they will pay for repairs. So a health insurance um, company is the same way. Um, before they will begin to pay out benefits, that patient has to pay that out-of-pocket expense. Now, that can be anywhere from, you know, I don't I don't know, it can be as a little, I don't know, $1,000, maybe um, I've heard one as high as $6,500, you know, that a patient has to pay out before 
the insurance company um, will pay, will begin to pay out benefits. So um, that's deductible. Co-payment is um, an out-of-pocket expense. However, that is the amount that a patient has to pay at the time of the visit. So co-payments has to be collected when a patient is in the office. And it depends on whether the patient is seeing their primary care or specialist. A lot of times patients may have to pay $10 or $15 for their PCP and then maybe $25, $30 for the specialist and then maybe $50 or $100 for ER. So that, that, that kind of varies um, by insurance and the plans that the patient has and also where the patient is going. But it's always a fixed amount. Allowed amount is the amount that the insurance company will allow the doctor to to bill to charge for a service. Um, and then the co-insurance, we briefly talked about that a couple questions ago. Um, that is what the patient that is, that is also an out of pocket expense, but it's a percentage of the visit. It's a percentage. So um, co-payment and co-insurance. A lot of people I've noticed a lot of my students get that get get those mixed up. But just remember that the co-payment is a fixed amount and the co-insurance is a percentage of the visit. All right, so let's see. Which of the following indicate medical necessity on a claim form? Diagnosis code, insurance carrier's identification number, NPI number, or POS code? Diagnosis code, insurance carrier's identification number, NPI number, or POS code. Medical necessity. All right, let's see. Okay, and the answer is the diagnosis code. The diagnosis code or ICD-10 code that is what indicates the medical necessity. That is what is telling the insurance company why the, the provider is billing for the services that they're billing for, okay? The insurance carrier's identification number, that doesn't indicate medical necessity. It has nothing to do with why the doctor is billing for the services the doctor is billing for. NPI number, um, the national provider identification number has nothing to do with medical necessity. That is the um, that is the um, doc, that is the number that the providers are assigned, the 10-digit number. Um, the POS code, that is a place of service code, has nothing to do with medical necessity. Now, a place of service code indicates to the insurance company where the visit took place, so whether it was in the uh, office or whether it was in the hospital or somewhere else. All right, let's see what the next question is. Which claim form is used for inpatient services? I'll go ahead and pause there and let you think about it. Is it the CMS 1500, UB04, DE2501, or CMS 1490S? Claim form for inpatient services. Inpatient services. All right, let's see. All right, if you chose UB04, you are correct. That is the claim form for inpatient services. The CMS 1500 is a claim form that we use. That's the universal claim form that we use in the provider's office. Um, C is DE2501. That's a disability form. And then the CMS 1490S, that is a form that patients fill out themselves um, to be compensated. So C and D, we can rule out. Those are forms that we don't deal with at all. Um, the CMS 1500, again, is a universal. And then UB04 is for inpatient. And remember, inpatient is um, hospital, nursing homes, um, what else, rehab, things like that, inpatient services. All right, medical term for abdominal wall, gastro, lapro, milo, or adeno. Medical term for abdominal wall, gastro, lapro, milo, or adeno. Okay. 
All righty, the answer is labro. Um, gastro refers to the stomach. Milo refers to um, bone marrow or the spinal cord. And then adeno refers to gland. All right. Medical term for hypertension. Um, low blood glucose, high blood glucose, high blood pressure, or low blood pressure. Well, it should say hypertension is the medical term for, but you get the question. Is it low blood glucose, high blood glucose, high blood pressure, or low blood pressure? All right, high blood pressure. If you chose high blood pressure, that is correct. So first of all, this is another one of those questions where we can automatically eliminate two of those options. Why? Because tension refers to pressure. So because we know tension refers to pressure, we can automatically eliminate glucose because that refers to sugar, right? Um, and then once we bring it down to pressure, okay, I know tension means pressure. Now, high blood pressure or low blood pressure well let's look at hyper what does hyper refer to Re hyper refers to high or increased so that's how we know that it's high blood pressure or maybe you went the other route maybe you looked at hypertension and maybe you automatically ruled out low blood glucose and low blood pressure because you know hyper means high and so maybe you came down to high blood glucose and high blood pressure and then you ruled out glucose because you know, again, that tension means pressure. So however you have to go about ruling out, you know, whatever works for you is fine. But just remember, like I always tell my students, you always want to go about these questions with ruling out answers that you absolutely know that it's not. Hi, I see a couple more people have joined live. Feel free to comment where you're watching from if you are watching live. If you want to, of course, no pressure. <laughs> All right. A patient presents for arrhythmia. Which specialist would the PCP refer the patient to? The neurologist, the cardiologist, pathologist, or the pulmonologist? Okay, let's see. All right, if you chose cardiologist, you are correct. So an arrhythmia is an abnormal rhythm, right? Abnormal heart rhythm. So in that case, we will refer the patient to a cardiologist. Cardio refers to heart. So we will refer that patient to a heart specialist. Neurologist, um, we will refer people who have nerve disorders, um, pathologists, they deal with diseases, and then pulmonologist um, is a lung specialist. So pulmono refers to the lung. All right, let's go to the next question. Which of the following info is on an EOB? Which of the following info is on an EOB? So what is an EOB? I'll go ahead and tell you all what an EOB. And I want you to think about it for a second. What is an EOB? So um, is it going to be the NPI number, the employer ID number, remaining deductible or claim adjustments? What is an EOB? This is information you have to know. If you're taking that CMAA certification exam, you should already, you should already know what an EOB is. All right, let's go ahead and see what the answer is so we can talk about this for a second. All right, so claim adjustments. So first of all, an EOB is an explanation of benefits. And what does the explanation of benefits do? So that's um, what the patient gets in the mail from the insurance company that lets the, that, that pretty much spells out everything that the insurance paid for and whether something was denied. So explanation of benefits. I always tell my students, think about what you're saying explanation of benefits. It's explaining the benefits, what was paid out, 
um, the claim, any adjustments that was made to the claim. Um, remaining deductible wouldn't be included on that. Now, the patient will get something from the insurance company um, to let them know how much of the deductible they had left to pay, but that's not going to come on an EOB. Um, employer ID number has nothing to do with the explanation of benefits. Neither does the MPI number. So even though we put that MPI number on the claim form, a patient is not going to get that on their EOB. So again, if any of this information you have further questions about, always feel free to comment down below and we can talk about it. All right. Microsoft Excel is which type of program? And then you got to know this, you know, for these questions, because you'll see it written. You you may, um, first of all, all of these questions you're going to see written differently. But you want to know, again, um, there's only one answer that we can choose. But once we choose that answer, you want to also make sure you know what each of those other answers mean in case you see that question written in another way or you see one of the other options as a question. Microsoft Excel, is it a database management? Is it a spreadsheet application, word processing or graphics application? Microsoft Excel. So many of you probably already know this from experience. But it's a spreadsheet application. And the reason why I said you want to know what all of these options are, because you're going to see other questions that ask, OK, what is um, um, what 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 um, what um, software do you use for database management? You have to know that that's Microsoft Access. Right. Or you may see a question that says, what type of program is Microsoft Access? You'll need to know is database management. You may see a question that says Microsoft Word is which type of program you have to know is word processing or maybe written the other way. And you have, you know, about word processing and you have to know the answer is Microsoft Word, right? Graphics is Adobe Photoshop. And so this is why I say it's so important to make sure you know what each of the other options are. So even though they these are not the these are the options are not the answer, make sure you know what each of those things are, because, you know, this is one of the things my students saw a lot of questions well not a lot but they did see questions about you know the different um programs all right what is the purpose of a matrix is it to create flexible waiting time for the patients to determine patient appointment cancellations to differentiate between new and established patients or to indicate when the provider is unavailable to treat patients the purpose of a matrix. And of course, we're referring to an appointment matrix. What's the purpose of the appointment matrix? Give you a moment to think about that. Okay, let's see. To indicate when the provider is unavailable to treat patients. So with the appointment matrix, the very first thing you're going to do, you're going to block off all the unavailable times before you begin to schedule patients. So meeting times, administrative times, lunch times, right? Um, um, at, um, um, buffer time or any any time that's not available, you want to uh, um, indicate that time on the on indicate that time first. And then you begin to schedule your patients. All right. Which of the following is required by OSHA to stay in compliance? Participate in training concerning infection control, register with the CDC, schedule a hepatitis B immunization, or undergo a physical exam. You're trying to stay in compliance with OSHA. All right. All righty. So if you chose A, you are correct. Participate in training concerning infection control. So let's look at these other options. So register with the CDC, schedule hepatitis B immunization and undergo a physical exam. So those are things um, that's um, first of all, uh, hepatitis B and physical. They are probably um, require for your job because some jobs they do require you to get a hepatitis B vaccine, but that's not a, a OSHA. Um, that's not a, re a OSHA regulation, right? Registering with the CDC, 
it's not an OSHA regulation or undergoing a physical. However, training and infection control is. Remember, OSHA is Occupational Safety um, and Health Administration, and they regulate infection control, right? And so it is mandatory for us as medical professionals to undergo training. Okay. All right. Obtaining vitals without consent can be a form of which of the following? Assault, battery, negligence, or fraud? Assault, battery, negligence, or fraud. So you're obtaining the vitals. You're, you're obtaining vitals without the consent of the patient. Which of the following can be a form? Which of the following? Um all right, let's see. So that's going to be battery. So that's going to be battery. So um, assault is the attempt or the threaten to touch, right, or to harm. Um, negligence, of course, is failure to um, provide reasonable service. And then fraud, of course, is falsifying information, just outright just lying. That is fraud. All right. Which of the following abbreviations means reason for the visit? P.E., R.O.S., C.C., or S.H.? Reason for the visit. P.E., R.O.S., C.C., or S.H.? You chose CC, you're correct, chief complaint. That's the reason for the visit. PE is physical exam. ROS is review of symptoms. So that's when a doctor review each of the patient's body systems. And then SH is social history. So that's where information like whether a patient smokes or drinks or exercises, things like that, that'll go under social history. Okay. Which of the following, this is a good one, well, not, not that the other ones weren't good ones, but this is another good one. Um, which of the following is within the scope of a CMA or Certified Medical Administrative Assistant when it comes to handling specimens? So remember, we're on the administrative side. Even though I teach both clinical and administrative medical assistant, this is on the administrative side. Matching the specimen to the demographics on the patient's chart processing the requisition for shipment, preparing the specimen for secure transport, or ensuring proper storage of the specimen prior to shipment. Which of the following is a scope? So remember, we're on the administrative side. Look at these options again. Rule out what you absolutely know that is not first, because a couple of those things you can automatically look at and rule out. Two of those things I'm looking at right now that, you know, I can look at and say the administrative staff would never do because it's outside of our scope. Okay, so let's see. All righty, if you chose B, processing the requisition for shipment, you are correct. Let's look at this. First of all, C and D, we can root out automatically. Why? Because we're medical administrative assistants. Preparing the specimen and ensuring proper storage, that is outside of our scope because that's the clinical staff. We can never handle the specimen as medical administrative assistants, okay? Now, let's look at A, matching the specimen to the demographics. I can see somebody seeing demographics and thinking, oh, that's administrative, right? No, because it says matching the specimen. We're handling the specimen. However, we can process the requisition. The requisition is the form that goes along with the specimen. So this does not involve us handling the specimen because this is the form that shows the patient's information and also the test that is being done on that specimen. So this is something that we can do as medical administrative assistants. We absolutely can process the requisition for shipment. I think I have just a couple more questions here. All right. 
which part of Medicare covers both inpatient and outpatient services? Part A, Part B, Part C, or Part D? Medicare covers both inpatient and outpatient. Is it A, B, C, or D? If you chose C, you're correct. C covers both inpatient and outpatients. Part C is also known as Medicare Advantage. Part A is inpatient. B is outpatient. C is both, right? Medicare Advantage. And then D is prescriptions. When you think of D, think of drugs for prescriptions. So A is in, B is out. C is both or Medicare Advantage. And then D is drugs, prescriptions. You got to know those parts of Medicare. All right, what's the CMAA's, CMAA's role in the auditing process? Initiating the audit, maintaining day sheets, making documentation um, corrections, or changing codes on claims. What is our role in the auditing process? So if the office is being audited, what is our role? Are we going to initiate the audit, maintain day sheets? make documentation corrections, or change codes on claims. All right, maintain the day sheet. So we're absolutely not going to initiate the audit. That's coming from the IRS or whoever else is auditing us. Um, we're not going to make documentation corrections because what's done is already done. Um, changing codes on claims, absolutely, we're not going to commit fraud, right? However, we can and we absolutely must maintain day sheets. What are day sheets? Day sheets are um, the daily transactions of the office. So payments that we're making, payments that we're receiving, that's the day sheet, right? Um, and so that is our role is making sure we maintain these records. So if the office is audited, we already we have that information readily available. All right. Which of the following greetings is written correctly? Look at each of these carefully. Which of the following greetings is written correctly? Look at each one. Look at this dear Mr. Goodwin with the colon. Dear Mr. Mark Smith, MD, the comma. R.E. colon Jane Hutley. And then dear Dennis written correctly. So this is for a professional letter, a patient, a letter that we would send a patient. Which of the following is written correctly? I'll give a couple more seconds to look over this. And if you're watching a replay, you can always pause it to give yourself some time to think about it before we go into the correct answer. All right, let's see. All right, if you chose A, you're correct. So we absolutely can write um, Dear Mr. Goodwin with a colon. We can also use a comma as well, but this is the only one that is written correctly when it comes to a professional letter to a patient, okay? So Dear Mr. Mark Smith, MD, first of all, if he's a doctor, we're not gonna write Dear Mr. Mark Smith, MD. We're just gonna simply write Dear Mark Smith, MD or Dear Dr. Mark Smith, right? Um, it, there's no need to write both this prefix and the suffix, okay? Um, R.E. Jane Hutley, this is a subject line. So this is where we would write, um, this is what we would put in the subject line of like an email or even a letter um, or memo. This, this explains what the subject is. And then Dear Dennis, that's too informal. We're not going to write a patient, you know, we're not going to just say Dear Dennis or write a doctor, Dear Dennis. So this is very informal. All right, last question. The maximal, the maximum allowable time from the date of service that a claim can be submitted to Medicare is 30 days, six months, 12 months, or 32 months. The maximum allowable time from the date of service that a claim can be submitted to Medicare. This is the amount of time we have to submit a claim to Medicare from the time that the patient was seen, which is the date of service. How long do we have? 30 days, six months, 12 months, or 32 months?
And the answer is 12 months. We have a we have a year. We have 12 months. All right. So this is actually going to conclude tonight's study session. So if you enjoyed it, please let me know if this was helpful at all. If you have any other questions about any of the questions that um, I went over tonight, definitely let me know in the comment section. If you would like another video like this, let me know. I'll try to get something together for you. If you like this live session, let me know if, if it's better to just pre-record and upload it. Um, for the few of you that hung in there with me live, thank you for hanging in, in here with me. I thank you so much. This is my first time going live on this channel. If you're not already subscribed, go ahead and do that. And go ahead and um, give me a thumbs up on this video so I can get this video out there. Thank you to all of you who have been following this channel. I've only had this channel for a year. I don't upload a lot on it. I upload more to my personal channel, but this channel has really grown. I get so many emails every day. Almost, it seems like I'm getting an email from you all. Thank you for being patient as I try to get to them. I try to get to them as quickly as possible, but thank you. If you have any video ideas, questions, feel free to email me. I will leave my email down below. Once again, I thank you for visiting this channel. I hope that this video was helpful. So um, if you have any subjects, like I said, you want me to cover, definitely let me know. Email me or comment down below. And if this was helpful, let me know what was the most helpful part about this. Anything I can do differently next time or anything you want me to keep doing. Thank you. Have a good night or a good day, depending on your time zone. <laughs>